Hey everybody, this is Zachary Jeans. Let's keep walking through the Bible. So today is day 345 and we are working our way through Genesis. Uh, now we are getting into the life of Jacob's kind of towards the end of his life and we're going to enter the story of Joseph. Um, today we're going to uh, briefly touch on Esau's genealogy and the promise that God would make a great people through him, um, irregardless of the fact that the blessing did eventually land on Jacob as promised, right? Uh, he's a son of Jacob. He's ultimately a son of Isaac and, and Abraham. He's in that line, and so he's blessed as well. Won't spend a whole lot of time on the genealogy. We'll just note a couple things. Um, but we will look at Joseph's dream and how he gets sold into uh, slavery down into Egypt, and, and we'll move on. So, um, hey, thank you so much for your love. Thank you for your, your little likes and shares and comments. I appreciate you. Um, that's how you grow, grow this uh, ministry is if uh, you keep sharing and caring that way. So um, why don't we stop? Why don't we pray? And then we're going to open up chapter 36. All right. Lord, I love you. God, thanks for your word. God, thank you for giving me this time to get into it. Um, yeah. Some days you just you give an abundance, Lord, and I'm, and I'm cognizant of that today. Lord, I love you. God, please bless those who we love that are um, off on adventures. And please bless their, their path, their feet with you. God, please bless us to uh, walk in the ways in which you want us to walk, Lord. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right, yeah. We all got to walk in the path which God gives us, and it's hard to know at times, you know, what's our path and what's his path. And I mean, ultimately, he'll bless us nonetheless, but trying to find out, God, you know, is there something you want me to do or a place you want me to go, uh, some sort of work? And I uh, always got to talk to the Lord about it. I think some people take that into their own hands and they just say, look, Lord, it's too hard for me to sort out what you're saying. So I'm just going to do and do right by you as best I can. And God honors that. Um, there's a little bit more challenging a, a road to ask the Lord for help, for discernment, for understanding. And as we'll see in Jacob's life at the end here, and now Joseph taking on this sort of mantle of this conversation about the uh, the salvation of of, of peoples through Israel, through this Abrahamic covenant, um, <laughs> that road twists and turns, man. It does not look, it does not go the way in which we think it'll go, right? Not a steady climb up the stairs. There's some descending into pits. So, yeah, if you're in some pits, um, it's not necessarily out. It's not necessarily. It is not without God's hand that you are there. And yet he is not saying that he does evil against you. He's simply taking the evil that's done against you. And he's willing to allow you to go through that to achieve good in your life and glory for, for God. Give you a chance to give God glory. All right. All right. So. Chapter 36. I'm going to largely forgo reading the whole chapter here. It's just a bunch of names. Um, it, is, it is important to note that these sons of Esau who were born to him in the land of Canaan, Canaan um, dwelled in the hill country of Sarah. That's Edom. Okay, And all these chiefs, all these peoples, okay, they down the line, many hundreds of years later, uh, along with the sons um, of Lot, okay, his descendants, both Edom and the sons of Lot, and then, of course, the Canaanites are already there, are going to be thorns in Israel's side for hundreds of years, okay? So, even though Esau doesn't come with his 400 men 
and obliterate or attack or try to obliterate Jacob and his family coming out of the east, Padan and Aram, down the line, there will be a back and forth that will go on for centuries. Some would even say, and I, there seems to be good evidence for this, but whatever. Some would even say that even King Herod is a descendant ultimately from this tribal line in Edom. I've read that. Um, I'm not standing on that right now because I want to, I would want to go back and, and really do a, a harder study on that. But just to, but just to throw it out there, that it, the possibility of that being the case and thinking about Herod's role, um, in trying to take down ultimately a son of Israel, Jesus Christ, right? The promised Messiah. So, but if that's not true, regardless, the people that we're talking about that did, that descended from Esau um, gave all kinds of trouble. And I say trouble. They didn't send nasty notes. Like there was actual conflict. People lived in, in, in fear and died. And, uh, and we'll read about that in coming, coming days. Well, not quite coming days, but soon. Um, we'll read about that as we're working our way through the Old Testament. So, Jacob lived in the land. We're picking up in chapter 37, verse 1. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojournings. It's in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Billa and Zilpha. So the two concubines, the two servants, had their kids. And they've obviously got families as well. And uh, Joseph, being a young man, born to Rachel, Jacob's first love. And he's out there kind of learning the trade. Okay. And Joseph brought a bad report to them of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. They're jealous. Jacob sort of didn't do him any favors. He's one of the young kids in the family um, and he you know makes him a special robe and people have written a lot about that it could be denoting it, it could have all kinds of different things and we won't get into that but the important point is he was wearing some clothes that were different and that were given by the one the patriarch of the family who can designate like blessing and authority and all kinds of stuff, right? Joseph isn't the oldest kid in the family. In, in, in that culture, the oldest, right? Typically, all the younger serve the oldest. That was the whole crazy thing about Jacob and Esau. The older shall serve the younger, was the prophecy. So, but generally speaking, the oldest and then tiered all the way down to the youngest, that was the pecking order, right? Once you got down around where Joseph was, there wasn't there wasn't a whole lot of respect. I mean you you were at the bottom of the of the pile. Now it also says that Joseph was the son of Jacob in his old age. Technically that would be Benjamin. I don't know if in this spot that that has something to say about Benjamin and his health. I don't know. Like it strikes me that there's something going on there. It could just be that, that, and this is something that I kind of am thinking about, like, so the whole oldest 
son. So Joseph is the oldest son of his first love. So he takes prominence in that distinction, right? Not his oldest son. That would go to Leah, Reuben. Um, but it's Joseph who's the oldest born between Benjamin and Joseph. All right. Be that as it may. <laughs> Joseph isn't appreciated by his other brothers. Now, Joseph had a dream, and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. He said to them, hear this dream that I have dreamed. Behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright, and behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. His brothers said to him, are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule, or, or are you indeed, wait a minute, are you indeed to reign over us, or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams, for his words. So this is not the only dream, it's dreams, right? He's had multiple dreams, this is just one we get. And Joseph is a little bit half cocked and that he doesn't know when to keep his mouth shut he just opens it up like oh let me tell you about the dream i had let me get all up in your grill i'm going to say whatever comes to my mind almost right no filter and uh he could have kept it to himself and he could have spoken up at the right time just like why did he go off and 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 speak ill of his brothers and what they're doing with their business out in the fields and whatnot. I guess if Jacob had asked, then he'd be obligated, but Jacob didn't ask. Doesn't seem to be like a major incident like Shechem, remember? Like it wasn't something arising to that level of, uh-oh, God tell dad. Um, but Joseph just had a, a strict sense of, of right and wrong and he didn't, and that's a good thing. And at the same time, he couldn't keep his mouth shut. In a way, maybe that's a good thing too. Um, but there's wisdom, right? When to speak up and when not. You know, wise as a serpent, peaceful as a dove, the, the wisdom says. And Jesus said that, okay? So, but J uh, Joseph just hauls off and, and tells him his dreams. Hey, someday I'm the young guy here. You give me all this crap, but I'm telling you, I had this dream. You know, my stock rose up above yours and yours bowed down. You want to interpret that for me? <laughs> they do. Okay. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers and said, Behold, I have dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, the 11 stars are, and 11 stars are bowing down to me. But he told it to his father and to his brothers. His father rebuked him and said to him, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow, to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous of him, but his father kept the same in mind. Look, he had heard things that were wild in his own life, about his own life. But this is a shocker, right? This isn't something that Jacob had received from the Lord. This is something that Joseph, his son, had received. So he's like, mm, I'm going to tuck this one away, right? Kind of like Mary storing up all the, treasuring all these things up in her heart. Jacob's treasuring these things up. He's like, Wondering, how in the world, this is from the Lord, how in the world is it that I'm going to bow down to you? Like, I see your brothers, maybe. How am I going to bow down to you? Jacob wasn't told by the Lord that Isaac and, and his mom, right, were going to bow down to him. But he's told his brother would, basically. Um, but this is the next level. This is pretty unheard of that a father would bow down to his son in this context. 
right? So he tucks that saying away. And as we know later on in the story, well, he'll be brought down eventually during a great famine. Now his brothers went to pasture their flocks near Shechem. <laughs> Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said to him, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man found him wandering in the fields, and the man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers. He said, Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. You gotta wonder if that was an angel or that just a regular guy. I wonder the Lord's directing things down there. Oftentimes it says we entertain angels and don't know. They saw him from afar, and before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let's kill him. Let's throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we'll see what will become of his dreams. Okay. And plotted his murder. That's how jealous they were. It's also how ruthless these guys are. I mean, they'd wiped out all the men of Shechem over their sister. We talked about that. Pretty brutal, right? These are some surly guys. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand to restore him to his father. So Ruin's going to do right, even though he had already done wrong and slept with his dad's, you know, wife, Bila. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe and the robe of many colors that he had worn. And they took him and threw him into a pit. And the pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, and their camels bearing gum, balm, myrrh, and they were on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judas said to his brothers, what profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let's sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him. For he is our brother, our own flesh. So now Judah, <laughs> trying to do some right by a really wrong situation. It's like, you know, let's not actually slaughter the kid. Let's just sell him off. Let's send him down to Egypt. He'll be out of our ears. Don't have to hear this crap from him all the time. Just popping off, saying all this stuff. We don't have to look at that stupid robe anymore. Let's get him out of here, right? You got Reuben and Judah who are trying to do their best uh, in a bad situation. Okay. So. Sorry, I lost my place. Then Judah said, to, yeah, what if we sell him? Okay. And his brothers listened to him. Then Midianite traders passed by, and they drew Joseph up and lifted him up out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. Now, it was um, it was noted in one of the commentaries I'm reading uh, that the, the price for a slave or a child was 20, uh, but a grown man, yeah, a child was for 20 shekels and a grown man was 30. So of course the 30 pieces of silver for Jesus, uh, you know, to Judas. And here, uh, Joseph is sold for 20, being 17 years old, still considered a boy. Although that's interesting because sometimes we get this impression that, you know, boys were considered men 
at a younger age. Whatever, I think that Genesis states that he is considered a boy still. And the text suggests that. And then the sale price here of 20 shekels does as well. Okay. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy's gone, and I, where shall I go? Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in blood. And they sent the robe of many colors and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, It is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph has been torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put sackcloth on his loins and mourned his son many days. All his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him. But he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. A couple notes here. Isn't it interesting, this whole dipping of clothing in blood, um, this whole sort of deception with the clothing and the, the robe? Doesn't it remind you of the thing that Rebecca and Jacob had done to his dad? Isaac, remember when they'd slaughtered the goat and put like, you know, <laughs> the goat skins on his arms and around his neck and, you know, made him wear, you know, Esau's robes. Same, it's like, same old trick in a way. It's a little different, right? They dipped his, in, you know, the blood in there and they implied that he was dead. They didn't imply that uh, Jacob was dead in front of his father they just swapped out like this concept that it was Esau. It was actually Jacob. But this deception, this deception permeates down through the line in this family. And that is so hard and so troubling. And um, there are people who don't like uh, the Jewish people who point this fact out and, and, and um, get kind of racist, kind of. They are. And... I think it's fair to point out that this this trait, when you point out a trait in the Bible, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're racist or something like that. This is clearly here. This is in the Jewish Bible. This is in the formation of the Jewish people and the Israelites. This is something that um, that has just uh, been a part of the story um, for hundreds and hundreds of years. But that doesn't mean that every person is trying to deceive you if they're if they're Jewish or whatever. And it doesn't give you license to somehow hate a people group. Okay. Um, but there's a lot of hate in this world. And, and I'm sorry for it. I'm sorry that people are that way. Not everybody in this family is like that. Reuben was trying to do right by him. Judah was trying to do right by him. Uh, obviously, Joseph is going to try and do right by his whole family, even though they did him wrong. Another point is he had many other sons and daughters. I think this is just my opinion with all of the genealogies that they are representative. And that's even with the ages and the lines. And I think that it's much like the way that the calendar stretches in and out, depending on the genealogy, the time frames. I don't, I don't think that they're conclusive. Like, I think they're representative. And I also think here that it says that um, all his sons and all his daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. Him. Now, does that mean he had granddaughters that are comforting him? Um, did he have some other wives? Are there other children to these other uh, women uh, that aren't listed here? I think he had other sons and other daughters. I think that he was fruitful and multiplied, but that those women that he had children with aren't listed in here, or that there were other children that were less prominent in the lineage from the other wives, whether it's Billah, Zilpha, Leah, or Rachel, um, it's entirely possible. 
there were other sons and daughters. How they came, we don't necessarily know. But because we don't know, doesn't mean they didn't come. They're there, right, in the text. And uh, it's interesting to think about, I think. I Interesting to think about, I think. It is, because we are just getting a little glimpse, right? We're just barely seen into what's going on here. Okay, so you got to be careful not to over-speculate. But we shouldn't close down our view of things just because a text like that kind of knocks us off balance. There were other sons and daughters that tried to comfort Jacob. So there's more daughters than Dina, more sons than the ones they've got than he's listed. So it happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adul Adulamite whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite woman whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her, and he conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in Chezob, or Chezob, when she bore him. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. Then Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her. Raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan knew that the offspring would not be his. So whenever he went into his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till Shelah grows up, for he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. It's a pretty, pretty bum situation. Guy's just getting sex for nothing, right? And he's treating it with so much disrespect. It's kind of like he's getting laid by this other woman, his side piece, all in the name of honoring God and giving her children and continuing the line of the people. And, uh, and he's like crapping all over that. And it's so wrong. You know, in our society, we would never do this anyway. This whole like, you know, giving, giving kids to your family and this and that. Um, but in their culture in this time, that's how, how it went. And they were, the, the underlying principle is he's violating God's purpose and be fruitful and multiply. Honor your family. Give children to this family that it might grow. And he's like, no, I'll just take the sex. So you can apply that into your life however you want. But I'm going to tell you, uh, having sex for sex sake outside of marriage is wrong. I mean, he's going to make it abundantly clear later in the law. And uh, Jesus makes it abundantly clear in his teachings. If you're like, well, the law doesn't apply to me. Okay, well, Jesus talks about it too. <laughs> so, but it's always kind of been wrong here, right? And it's really wrong in this context. So, in the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. When Judah was comforted... Um, he went up to Timnah to the sheep shearers, he and his friend Hira, the Adamite. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with the veil, wrapping herself up, and sat at the entrance of Enum, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown up and she had not been given to him in marriage. He had not followed through with this promise. Not only had she been taken advantage of by her dead husband's brother, okay, 
But now the younger son who is to be given to her so that she could have kids, that she could have a marriage now, um, and it's not happening. So Judah's not doing right by, by her. So when Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, Come, let me come into you. For he did not know that she was his daughter in law. She said, What will you give me that you may come into me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, If you give me a pledge and you send it, he said, What pledge shall I give you? She replied, Your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her, and he con and she conceived by him. Then she arose and went away, taking off her veil, and she put on the garments of her widowhood. She just presents herself, and alluringly so. But Judah, being the cad that he is, now without his wife, thinks that he's free and clear to kind of go hook up with any anything that he sees and he's like man she looks good can't recognize her because she's got the veil on and who knows how how much she's displaying but he's like i want that and and it's interesting that he doesn't even recognize her voice right that's how distanced he had become from her all these years it's not like they're on the phone and she can be kind of set off to the side and she also obviously disguised her appearance and voice a bit but uh yeah he has sex with his his uh daughter-in-law how about that <laughs> how about that she has a kid through him so when judah sent the young goat by his friend the adumite a dolomite to take back the pledge from the woman's hand he did not find her and he asked the men of the place where is the cult prostitute who is at enum by the roadside and they said no cult prostitute has been here so he returned to judah and said i've not found her also the men in place said no cult prostitute has been here so judah replied let her keep the things as her own or we shall be laughed at they're going to be mocked like hey man you've been caught you see i sent this young goat and you didn't find her now let me tell you dudes and women but mostly guys are going off to other countries in this current day and they think that they're free and clear to do whatever they want and they're on business trips or whatever and dude they are getting caught they're being um, filmed and if you think you're free and clear in today's you weren't free and clear back here you are not free and clear today, not only from a sinful, like you're breaking God's law, right? But if you think you're going to some brothel or some Airbnb and hooking up with some woman or some, some other worse situation, dude, you are being filmed. And that film is going to then be sent to you as a clip. And you are going to be blackmailed. And be told that if you don't send money, that clip is going to be sent to basically your whole list. To everybody you know or put out publicly. That's happening every single day in this world. Okay. Now, the only way out of this is to confess your sin to those that are closest to you. And don't pay that ransom and stop sinning. Okay. Okay. Just fess up. Fess up. Take the power away from the person blackmailing you and admit your guilt. Don't try and cover. Wrong is wrong. Okay? But once you send that money over, guess what? They're just going to keep rolling you. So don't try to deny it if you've done wrong. Fess up. Get right with the people in your life. Get help. And don't send those people money. And don't go do it again. All right?
And if you can't travel for business and keep your hands to yourself, then don't go. Find something else to do in life, right? Okay, there's lots of temptation in this world. I've traveled internationally. I've had stuff thrown at me and I get it. There's all kinds of opportunity, but you got to trust in the Lord. You got to honor him and honor those that are around you. Okay. Got to. And if you can't, got to come on home. Okay. I'm just pleading with you. But don't fall into the trap, the cycle of this blackmail, because they ain't going to stop just at a few thousand bucks. It's going to be, okay, well, we got one more thing. And, uh, now we need you to just do something for us. <laughs> Great. Right? So, um, I just heard uh, on the Ryan Rosolo podcast, Life Advice. Uh, they always do Life Advice. Granted, it's from a secular point of view. But I love it because they're dealing with real world situations. What do I do? And in our church, we don't deal with this stuff out in the public. And in one of the letters, one of the emails, the guy's asking, what do I do? What do I do? I screwed up. I did the wrong thing. I got caught. Now I don't know what to do. I dealt with this situation. So we're just going to finish up here with Judah and the outcome of this sin, right? So about three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law has been immoral. <laughs> More, moreover, she's pregnant by immorality. Judah said, bring her out. Let her be burned. That's pretty horrific. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, by the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, please identify who these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Then Judah identified them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son, Shalah. And she did not know, and he did not know her again. He didn't have sex with her again. When the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb. And when she was in labor, she put out a hand and the midwife took and tied scarlet thread on his hand. This one came out first, but he drew back his hand. Behold, his brother came out and she said, what a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore, his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out with scarlet thread on his hand and his name was called Azera. So Perez means breach. So, one, that's a harsh punishment, man. Bring her out to be burned. That is horrific. No matter how wrong some of these sins are in our world, my goodness, we have to... <laughs> look, we need to show grace for people who do wrong. Got to give people a chance to turn around. Thank God... <laughs> Uh, for her sake, and for Judah's sake, for that matter, that Tamar had the wherewithal to sort of like capture this information to hold them accountable. Um, there's no right and wrong on this situation. It's all screwed up. And in this world, there's all kinds of situations where it's not just like, oh, here's the good side and here's the bad side. It's like there's good, good and bads on both sides. And I think that's what you have in the story of Tamar and Judah. And we don't know what sins her husband had committed, right? Um, but get the impression it's something not good. It's kind of like, you know, Cain, <laughs> cursed of the land. Um, something bad. Something bad. So um, anyway, hey, so good to get in this with you. Um, it, again, if you're struggling with pornography or giving into just deep and dark wrong things when you're abroad and traveling, first stop, repent, talk to your family and the people that are close to you and you got to fess up and whatever judgments they have on you, you deserve it, right? You deserve it. But do not give in to the blackmail that's coming into your life because that's only going to 
create more horrible stuff down the road. Um, yeah, just, you gotta stop, you gotta stop. All right, hey, God bless you, keep walking, talk to you soon, bye-bye.